Majora's Mask, Book Four, Lamentation, Chapter 38, Ghosts and Phantoms. Let me out! Let me out! Wake! Help! Tattle slammed herself into the bottle's glass, wrapped in the darkness of a cloak. She refused to give in. She'd heard Link scream her name. However, his voice had grown more distant, and now she couldn't hear him at all. Did it injure him? She thought. Did it leave him for dead? Even if it hadn't left Link with a fatal wound, the cold would claim him soon. He was already weak from their traveling, and alone in the snow, he didn't stand a chance. The creature had come out of nowhere, forced her to trap herself, and now she couldn't see anything. Let me out of this bottle right now, you undead freak! <sighs> she wasn't even sure if it could hear her. Her own heavy breathing made her bottle warm, and her muffled voice echoed. Tattle relentlessly flung herself into the clear prison. If I keep slamming into it, that monster's pocket could rip open, the fairy thought. Then the bottle would fall out, hit a rock and shatter. She could fly away, never look at its face again, find Link, and get him help. You have no idea who you're dealing with! As soon as I get out of here, I'll... <laughs> Suddenly, the bottle lifted. Gloved black fingers pulled her back into the snowy world. They were still in the valley but there were no landmarks to guide them. She soon saw the face hidden within the hood, and she remembered to look away too late. Stop. No. As the blood in her body froze again, she decided this thing did not sound like a human. Its otherwise neutral voice was commanding, and its magical grip on her limbs and wings tripled the intimidation factor. The re-dead creature then stowed her back into its robes, and Tattle regained movements. She floated in place, sore all over again from the second grip. <sighs> it leaves me feeling so weak, Tattle thought, which made sense. This being was somehow taking over the blood in her body, immediately making every muscle throb. As she rested at the bottom of her prison, she decided this entity must have a secret identity. It doesn't make sense for a random, super-powerful monster to find us. No. There was more going on here. Tattle couldn't see where they were going and could only hear its boots crunching through the snow. Eventually, the crunching changed to an echo over stone. The blizzard's sounds faded too, and she realized they were in a cave. When the redead figure stopped walking, crackling fire soon broke the silence. A glove found her bottle again, and the monster pulled her out and set her on a stone floor. Through the glass, she saw they were deep in a tunnel that saved them from the relentless storm. Tattle's eyes flickered to her kidnapper. Its undead face had not changed. The redead cheeks were decayed and it had terrible, empty pits for eyes. Every inch of its body, including the top of its head, was covered. Huh? And I'm not freezing? Tattle realized, despite looking into its eyes. Apparently, the monster could turn its ability off at will. It merely stared at her for a moment, and the fairy was surprised when she felt awkward instead of afraid. Does it want to speak to me? The face was so still, no muscles reacted to convey emotion. Tattle looked around the cave, but she didn't see Link anywhere. A lit torch hung on the wall and illuminated the small cavern. A boulder in the center served as a table or chair. 
and a large backpack sat in the corner. The cave continued in two directions, marking this alcove as a reprieve from a longer cave system. She waited, but it never said anything. The being simply sat on the rock, turning away from her as it rummaged through its possessions. The fairy wrinkled her brow. What are you doing? Who are you? Her voice echoed in her ears, and she knew it must sound muffled to the redead. When the creature turned, it held a block of cheese and a knife. The monster cut free a thin slice and reached for a loaf of bread. Tattle scoffed. Uh, did you take me because you wanted someone to eat with? Do you kidnap all your dinner guests? It didn't respond. Or do you just want someone to watch you eat? I guess that makes you more than one kind of weirdo, you undead freak. You and I both know I'm not undead. It said. Tattle had guessed as much. Nothing about this thing suggested it was a mindless stranger. This was planned by someone they at least knew of. A theory popped into her head, but she had to be wrong. She wasn't. Its hands went to its face and removed it, revealing another one underneath. It was a mask, Tattle thought, which made complete sense. She should have known, but it had appeared so realistic. Red hair and a pale face replaced the undead facade, but he wasn't wearing his usual purple robes. Tattle immediately remembered when she, Tail, and the Skull Kid had robbed him. The rock had knocked the salesman out, but the Skull Kid had stayed there too long after stealing Majora's mask. When the mask salesman had opened his eyes, the imp fled immediately, leaving Tattle and Tail to stare at their angry victim. Oddly enough, the mask salesman's expression had softened considerably after looking at Tattle, but she'd been too afraid to stay behind and find out why. You? Her fear calmed. Why are you doing this? Link's out there right now, probably dying. We have to help him. A Goron is walking toward him. The man answered. His voice wasn't the cheery one from under the clock tower, nor the angry one when he'd been robbed. Today, the masked salesman appeared almost apathetic, his eyes downcast as he removed his gloves. On the right hand, Tattle saw a bright silver ring. Two gems, one red and one blue, were encrusted into the metal. They glowed with life. The fairy's confusion returned. Why did you... She asked, confused yet again by his solemn nature. Attack us! He paused before answering. I didn't think the boy would agree so easily to you dying. Me dying? Tattle said, confused by how matter-of-factly he'd said that. Are you hoping to starve me to death? No. The masked salesman took another bite. Are you hungry? I could spare some if you'd like. I know a few things about your kind. Fairies don't eat too much. But I imagine that boy has only the necessities on his travels. His name's Link, Tattle said. I'm aware of that too. Why did you let him live? And why are you waiting to kill me? I'm not going to kill you. He set the bread and cheese aside, drinking water from a bottle he hadn't used to kidnap a fairy. I intend to let the moon do that. She continued staring at him uncertainly. He still refused to meet her eyes as he leaned back against the cave wall. You're not man enough to do it yourself? If you're going to slaughter the helpless little girl you kidnapped, at least have the courage to- This isn't about you, the masked salesman said plainly. I'm doing this for the boy's sake. Tattle's eyes narrowed with anger. You're doing this just to hurt him? You sadistic- Say what you want about me what I'm doing is in everyone else's best interest. I don't believe you. How would hurting Link and killing me help anyone? I'm not killing you. I already told you. Link will kill you when he leaves you behind by going into the next cycle. He wouldn't. He will if he can't find you. Well, then Link wouldn't be killing me, would he? Tattle said. It'd be your fault because you hit me. He can't do anything about that. He promised he would never leave you behind, the masked salesman said. 
his choices, were he to act faithfully, would be to find you or die trying. Leaving you behind is an act of betrayal. Tattle's heart sank, but she repressed the fear threatening to reemerge. Link knows he can't die for me. He's the only one who can stop Majora. Her unmasked captor sighed. <sighs> then he'd still be putting his love for you second, no matter how you justify it. He's still leaving you behind to save himself. And no matter how you justify it, you're still responsible for emotionally destroying a boy by killing his friend. The masked salesman, for once, was at a loss for words. When she caught his eyes next, she thought she saw something other than indifference. I would get some sleep if I were you, he said. We won't be staying here for long. Tattle watched as the man crawled to his bag and rested his head against it. Hatred burned like a red-hot fire behind her eyes as she floated to the bottom of her bottle. I can't believe I was ever afraid of him, she thought. He's just a sad, pathetic man. I hate him. As Link pushed the clock tower doors open, he realized how much history these pieces of art had seen. During his short visit in Termina, they'd witnessed memories that would haunt him for the rest of his life. On one side, people he loved had died. On the other, he'd slain the man responsible for his losses. How many others had died before this door? Were there others still haunted by those events? Or was he the only one capable of remembering anything in this realm of shadows? The doors, at least, seemed to remember. He could feel an ancient knowledge hidden within their warm wood. The townspeople turned to look at him as he entered. Do they remember anyone else coming through here? Link wondered. They had, in cycles now past, witnessed him stumble through in a wide range of physical and mental conditions, but those witnesses died each time beneath the moon, which made Link believe the masked salesman's claims. How could these people be anything but shadows when they rose from the dead so easily? It was dreamlike. The bright sun, the faces of Clocktown's residents, the carpenters, the boy in the fox mask, the postman. But they're real, Link decided. Even if they are shadows, he could see it in their faces. He refused to believe the light in their eyes was only an illusion. Then he became aware of his body again, and its immense weakness. His adrenaline had faded. The health potion wouldn't last much longer. His face was discolored with bruises. The wound on his stomach was bright red, glistening from the hole in his tunic. One shoulder was still raw with infected claw marks, while the other throbbed internally. His hat was gone, lost somewhere in the explosion, raging river, or ocean. He was as pale as milk, and his eyes were glazed over. A long scar from what he remembered to be a horse chase was still on his leg, though now its true origin was a mystery. His right hand and foot still bore scars from Woodfall Swamp's poison, and his palms were healing from Snowhead's rugged rocks. And, of course, the scar on his chest was as large and black as ever, though that one remained hidden beneath his tunic. Somehow, Link still managed to move. He limped into the sunshine, raising his hand to block out its intensity. Link? Tattle said. The boy turned to see her watching with concern. Before we do anything else... <laughs> I know, he said. This time, I'll try not to faint. I don't want someone carrying me again. What happened? A stranger asked. They turned to see the lanky postman had stopped beside them. His red bag of letters was much more intact than Link's torn bag of possessions. Tattle's mind flashed back to Deku Link falling through the doors, collapsing on the ground in a pool of blood. He'd been perfectly fine inside the tower, but after passing through the doors... The fairy had watched a hundred gashes open in him instantaneously, out of nowhere. The postman had asked the same question then, just as ignorant as Tattle before her first venture with the Song of Time. This time, however, the postman's comment felt like she was watching a scripted play. Tattle's head swam, disoriented by all the contractions and pitfalls of time travel. 
Are you two okay? The postman said, deviating from his script when they didn't answer. I... Tattle started, but she couldn't answer. Not truthfully. You see, she thought, three days into the future, he ran across Termina to save me. A possessed child practically blew him up, and the moon fell, destroying the entire world and hurtling boulders in our faces that happened to block out the immense wave of fire that turned the rest of Termina into the world's largest seared steak. Uh, we had trouble getting here, she said instead. He's hurt. He needs help. So you both... The postman began, turning to the clock tower's doors. Came from those doors? From where? He'd said the same thing last time, immediately returning to his script. I don't have time to answer that question, Spiderlegs. By the time I finish, Fairy Boy over here would be dead. Now, please, can you help me get him back to the stockpot inn? I'll get Shikashi and see what he can do. Uh, hmm... The postman stammered, as if seriously considering how to weasel out of this. But all it took was one look at Tattle's narrowed eyes for him to think better of it. Uh, I can help you. Absolutely. Real quickly. Before it messes up my tight schedule. Thanks, Link said, putting an arm around the postman's shoulders. Together, they walked through South Clocktown as Tattle followed. Tattle awoke to find the masked salesman already alert and unmasked. His back was against the cave's rock wall, and he stared, transfixed, into his ring's blue and red gems. She forced all the hate she could into her eyes as she watched him, but he never turned to acknowledge her, as if that ring was the greatest attraction in all of Termina. So, are we just going to sit here until time's up? She said eventually. He didn't answer. Are you going down with the ship? That doesn't seem like your style, given how you sulk about in the shadows like a coward. Tattle paused, remembering all her conversations with Link about the masked salesman's apparent omnipotence. You go back in time with us, don't you? Still, nothing. How do you do that? Tattle persisted her hatred and curiosity constantly at war with one another. Who are you anyways? His only reply was to keep examining his jewelry. Tattle's anger reached a boiling point. You can't just ignore me! Tell me where in the name of Favor we're going! If you want the moon to kill me, why don't you just leave me here? Why does it matter where it squashes me flat? The masked salesman finally slipped the ring back on his finger and faced her. We must ensure the boy survives his trip through the Skull Kid's cave. He'll die if he goes in there alone. Why are you so interested in keeping him alive? How does taking me away from him help anyone? You already know more than you let on, the mask salesman said. I imagine it's not news to you that Termina is a land of shadows. Tattle's throat went dry. Shadows? She remembered her journey through the cave and the voices. She recalled the desolate wasteland on the other side, as well as Link reassuring her as she cried. Tattle, Tattle stop, 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 he'd said. That's not, not true. true. You're not, You're just, not a just a shadow, shadow. I, promise I promise you that. that. <laughs> Ghosts and phantoms, the mask salesman said. Mere shadows of other worlds and people. Tattle gulped. You mean we're all dead? The masked salesman paused, as if thinking through his answer. Not necessarily. It's irrelevant if the being you are molded from is still alive. What matters is that you are not a person. You're all half-people. Less than that, even. You may wear their faces, but you will never truly be them. So I'm wearing someone's face? Tattle didn't understand. The whole shadow thing. Deep down, it felt like it was true. But wearing someone else's face? My memories are my own, Tattle thought. It's never felt like I'm living someone else's life. 
Hmm, maybe that wasn't the best analogy. You are someone's face, but there's nothing hidden underneath. You're a shadow. Were you to leave this realm of darkness, you would go mad. That's why Majora's Mask was sealed away here, because no harm can be done to fake people. There is no one here to suffer. The ancient tribes who sealed it here, however, underestimated the mask's resilience. <laughs> it has taken quite a long time, but Majora is finally close to freeing itself. If the mask isn't stopped, it will escape Termina and destroy everything. That's why I need Link. That's why Majora's mask was sealed away here, the salesman had just said, as if he'd expected her to know Termina was a prison. And you kidnapped me to save Link from me. Her voice shook as she spoke that truth. <laughs> yes, the lure of the shadows can drive one mad. To see someone you've lost or left behind as if nothing bad ever happened to them. It's alluring and an extremely dangerous lie. Navi, Tattle said. The masked salesman expression tensed, but Tattle hardly noticed. Link thinks I'm Navi. Am I Navi? The brief flash of emotion in his face was already gone. <laughs> There's no way to tell for sure. Oh, wait, Tattle said. You know who Navi is? The salesman never averted his gaze. No. Right, she said, deciding against pressing the matter. Well, it doesn't matter if I'm a shadow of Navi or whatever. Link loves me for who I am. When we first started traveling together, I think it was hard for him. But after I died, and he went back in time to find another me, he's realized- No, the mask salesman said, interrupting her as he stood. You've only tricked him. No one can love a shadow. Not if they truly cared for the person they once were. So, did you fall in love with one of the shadows here? Tattle considered something else he'd said too. Did you try to take one out of Termina? So you could be with them in Hyrule. His face darkened. The masked salesman lifted the bottle and pulled her close to his face. <laughs> you are done speaking. If you say another word about the shadows, I will kill you myself. Right here. Right now. And find a way to deal with the consequences that follow. Tattle was not brave enough to defy him. She obeyed. The masked salesman stowed her back into his robes. We need to make sure the cave doesn't kill Link. Once he chooses to leave you behind, and the moon kills you, his betrayal will turn him into one of you. I will mold him into a shadow that does my bidding. After he's done in Snowhead, I'll be waiting for him in Clocktown, and ensure he gets me that mask. Link lay in bed, staring at the ceiling with covers drawn to his chest. His tunic was being washed and restitched, while an assortment of bandages covered his bare torso. Sunlight poured in through the window of Anju's room. It was orange with the light of a waning day. The afternoon sun bathed the nearby white wedding dress on the mannequin. He saw Great Bay's waves touring skyward, threatening all with its mighty, foaming fists. The moon had given them life, resurrecting their ancient power to destroy and consume. The dam's water had joined in, sweeping Link and Tattle away. He remembered spinning, suffocating, choking on its power. The memory of salty sea foam still gripped him with mortal terror. I'm gonna be late, he thought. I'm not gonna save Tattle in time. Sometimes in the water, he saw faces. Komez and Kotakes, Anjus, Navis, Zeldas. Even the masked salesman, sometimes his wicked laugh, and others his shocked face as the lightning bolt had struck him. A shadow, a shadow doesn't, doesn't have, have a heart, heart, the dark sorcerer had said. Then, 
Another tall wave would crash down, smashing through the hotel walls to carry with it corpses of old. And new, Link thought. Some of those deaths are new. He dozed in and out of sleep against his wishes, because he was afraid of his dreams. He didn't want to see the wasteland again. The black ashes, the absolute silence of a graveyard. In the dream, he would be stuck, alone the last living person on earth. The only thought that went through his mind was joining the dead, just to escape the darkness, to make it stop. But waking up spared him every time, leaving him even more terrified to return to sleep. I can't imagine that being real, Link thought. I can't imagine being the last living thing in so much darkness. If there had been any survivors after Majora's wrath had scorched the land, he decided they wouldn't be survivors for long. There was no willpower great enough to survive in a land like that. I need to get back to freeing the giants, Link thought. Lying still, everything felt worse. Nothing occupied his mind but the waves and the blood on the sand after the Skullcade attacked him. Maybe after I save Termina... The dreams will go away. The thought that they might not was too horrifying to consider. The last cycle had been the most traumatic yet. His journey through the cave and encounter with the redead creature had only been in the past three days. Before that, the siege of Clocktown had scarred him too. If he continued, what horrors remained? With two temples left, would things only get worse? Would Great Bay and the canyon prove even more hopeless? This land of shadows isn't meant for people like me, Link thought. He decided the masked salesman wasn't lying, at least not outright. If he stayed here much longer, he would eventually become another trapped resident of Termina, stripped of his identity. Unless Majora corrupts me first. The scar on his chest was still sore. Another recollection that plagued him was the Skull Kid pulling his dark magic free which he still didn't understand. It had hurt Majora. Somehow, the imp's curse had been corrupted. Did I change the magic somehow? Link thought. Did I make it my own? Is that a good or a bad thing? The fact that the imp was afraid of it boded well. Regardless, he had to fight the scar's effects, as he'd seen the danger they posed. Link turned to his bedside table and saw his ocarina. It was marked like he was. Does that mean it's being corrupted, like me? Would he have to destroy the Ocarina of Time, and himself, to ensure Majora never returned? Tattle interrupted his thoughts by entering the room. Hey, she said, eyeing the pale, bedridden boy carefully. Link rested his head back on his pillow. Hi. He replied numbly. Shikashi doesn't think you'll be able to walk before the carnival. Ah. He'd expected as much. Does Anju still want to take me with her? To the ranch? The innkeeper had offered him shelter there from the moon on more than one cycle. Yes. Do you think we should go? I don't think we really have much of a choice. Link said as Tattle floated to his bedside. Have you told them about us? About all the time travel? No, the fairy said. I didn't think it would make a difference. They're all just ghosts and phantoms who will forget, like me. Tattle. That's what the mask salesman said, Tattle interrupted. I don't care what the mask salesman said. <clears throat> He lied to us and manipulated me, you, a skull kid, and tail. There was a moment of silence. Do you believe what he said about the flood? His fairy asked. Link took a moment to answer. I don't know. I saw a drawing of it in the cave. But the masked salesman is too selfish to be a hero. He's not doing this to save Hyrule. He's doing this for himself. And I don't think he knows everything like he claims to, either. 
When Tattle didn't respond, her silence became as painful as the injuries keeping him in bed. Do you want to talk about any of it? Link asked. No, she said. I mean, not really. I told you almost everything, except a few things the masked salesman shared about himself, but... He doesn't matter anymore, Link said. He's dead. You checked under the tower and didn't see him. <sighs> yeah. She trailed off, unable to add more. Daddle, everything's going to be okay. He didn't believe that, and when Tattle looked up at him, he could tell that she didn't either. Regardless, he couldn't help but say words that had always come naturally to him. We'll take this one day at a time. What we both learned last cycle doesn't change anything. You're still my fairy. Of course. The silence that followed burrowed its way into Link's memories with all the rest of the horror. He merely watched as Tattle flew to lie on the other side of his head. They went to sleep, both too afraid to say more. When Tattle saw light next, the view overwhelmed her. A mountain valley descended into jutting rocks and chasms, eventually rising back into a high peak that encompassed the entire horizon. Even though she couldn't see what was on its other side, she remembered. Tattle knew exactly where they were. The masked salesman was dressed head to toe in black and once again wore the re-dead mask. Its dark pits did nothing to freeze her. His gloved hand merely held her prison firmly. He just removed her from his cloak. Why are we here? Tattle's voice echoed back to her in the small glass confines. At least it was warmer in there. The winter wonderland looked miserable out in the open air. She wondered how the masked salesman survived weather like this in only a cloak. The sorcerer responded by walking over to a boulder. He brushed it off and sat, placing the bottles beside him as they overlooked the valley together. Tattle was surprised when the fear she expected melted away. She watched the man beside her with confusion. What is he doing? I already told you, the sorcerer said. We're making sure Link doesn't die. Tattle felt a growing pressure to fill their silence, as if the salesman wanted her to, which didn't make much sense. Why should she care how he felt or what he wanted? The view from their perch was stunning. The morning sun was still young, and she realized there was no reason for the sorcerer to have taken her out of his robes. But she was grateful to see the second day shining so brightly in the white blanket covering Snowhead's rugged landscape. Uh, aren't you cold? Tattle said, finally daring to say something. Not when I'm wearing my ring. With his gloves, the ring was hidden, though Tattle noted its imprint for the first time on his hidden hand. Why is he letting me speak again? Tattle thought. Is, is this another chance? If I say the right thing here, can I save myself? And Link! She took a deep breath before speaking. You don't have to make Link a shadow, whatever that means. I know you think you need Majora, but Link and I... You and the boy can do nothing to stop what's happening, he said. Hyrule will be destroyed by a great evil. A flood will wipe away the entire land. Majora's Mask is the only thing that can save the world. And you and I both know Link will never hand it over willingly. He will insist on destroying it, maintaining his short-sighted view, his inability to see the grander picture. He will doom Hyrule, all to attempt to destroy something that can't be destroyed. Control is our only hope. So if he doesn't let me try, Hyrule will face the Flood and the Demon. And Majora won't stop with our homeland. No, if I take the Demon, I can use it to save so many lives. I can use it to... He didn't finish his thought. He, it'll corrupt you, Tattle said. He'll think it's under your control, but really, he'll do exactly what Majora wants. You sound just like the boy. Boy, you've spent too much time together. Tattle scoffed. Why are we having this conversation so you can have a second opinion on your evil plans? I'm not evil, 
Then why are you killing fairies, turning boys into shadows, and collecting dark masks? I'm not killing fairies. I'm destroying a shadow. The mask is a means to an end, as is the boy's sacrifice. To what end? A world ruled by Majora? Wouldn't the flood be a better end? The mask salesman glared at her. How can everything drowning be an acceptable future? If we do nothing, everyone dies. At least I have a plan. Everyone else in Hyrule will pray to gods with deaf ears. Gods who not only permit their slaughter, but encourage it. The noble and the faithful alike will meekly accept their fates when the rain comes. Why do you care so much about the people of Hyrule? Tattle asked. You don't seem to value life that much. I find it hard to believe someone as twisted as you would... She stopped short when the blood in her body froze. His dark eyes shone behind the mask as he stared into hers. Mortal terror flooded its way back into Tattle's body. No matter how much I want you to be her, I know you aren't, he said. His voice shook. No matter how much I wish that deep in your eyes, some remnant of her still exists. I know that's not true. I know because I found out the hard way. The people in this realm are malicious, selfish wisps of smoke. The mask, though, the mask. His voice wavered, and Tattle felt the grip on her loosen. He was silent for a moment, and Tattle wondered if he'd forgotten that she couldn't respond. The mask could bring them back for real. I'm sorry I killed you. I'm sorry I killed Zelda. I'm sorry Link has to become a shadow. I didn't choose this. But if we don't do this, if I don't do this, everyone is dead. Everyone. And after all it's done, I can make amends with Majora. I can bring people back for real. When he finally looked away, movement returned to her limbs. You're not her, Tattle. You were a fragment that would lose all meaning as soon as you entered another world. But I hope somewhere, somehow, she can hear me, and that she understands. He looked away now, up into the sky. I saw your brother and friend making their way to the cave. Tail will back out, but I'll convince him to go back so Link doesn't die. Then, Tail... We'll lead him to Snowhead and abandon him. I need Link to arrive in Clocktown alone. By then, I'll have given you to the Skull Kid, and I'll be waiting in the Clock Tower. The boy has forgotten his place. It's time I remind him. Hello? The innkeeper spoke from the door's other side. Can I come in? Yes, Link said, scooting up in his bed. Soon, Anju's familiar short red hair and dress were visible. She walked over to his bed and passed the mannequin, which she was also bound to wear and do the same things in every cycle. We're leaving for the ranch tomorrow, she said. You're still welcome to join us. Thank you, Link said. Do you want anything else to eat? No, I'm fine. Anju paused, appearing deeply troubled. Because of Café, Link remembered. Her lover. The innkeeper didn't realize he knew that, though. Unless I was talking about him in my sleep, like I did all those cycles ago. Which he doubted. There was a lot more on his mind now than there had been on those first days. He recalled his words as another version of Anju lay dying in South Clocktown. Somehow, in some place or time, I will bring you and Cafe back together again. Whatever it takes. Will I know? She'd asked. Will I feel it? Will I get to see him? Or am I gone now? It'll be some other new me, won't it? I'll still be dead. You'll know. Link wasn't sure that had been true as she looked at him from across the room now. Because she's a shadow, the boy thought. The mask salesman was right. When she turned to leave, Link stopped her. 
Anju? She paused. Has anyone else come from the Guac Tower before? From outside of Termina? He realized Anju had likely been wanting to ask him about his arrival, but she'd been too polite to ask. The innkeeper overcame her politeness at his invitation. Mm, not besides you. No one, ever? Link said. To be honest, I'm not sure how I got here, or what this place really is. I'm trying to find out as much as I can, to see if there's any way I can help. Help? The words sounded odd on her tongue, as if she'd only just realized they were in some deep, terrible trouble, beyond the moon's threat. I guess the Skull Kid came from the doors. He did? Link thought. He'd always assumed the Imp was an inhabitant of this realm. Was there more to the Skull Child other than just being the unfortunate creature who stumbled upon Majora? There was an old man, she said. It was quite a long time ago. I was too young to remember it. And it's not something we like to talk about. The clock tower doors, I mean. But when the old man came, my mother says it was day like any other. He stumbled out from under the tower in the middle of the day. and He seemed in a hurry to get somewhere. But as soon as he came out, he collapsed. His hair was long and white, and his face was more wrinkled than any of our elders. And he died, right there in South Clocktown, only a few seconds after he came in. But apparently, he was also the happiest man anyone had ever seen. He had relief on his face. Bliss. All he could do was smile as he died, near laughing. There were no signs of injury or distress. He appeared to be exactly where he wanted and none of the guards were brave enough to go through the doors to see where he'd come from. But it didn't matter, in the end, because he was dead, and no one knows his story. Link listened carefully, unsure what any of it meant. It didn't fit any other puzzle pieces Link had about Termina. It's no wonder everyone is so afraid of the doors, Link said eventually. An evil skull kid, a dead man... And me are the only people who've come through. Anju smiled softly. I'm glad you came. At least we'll have one happy story to add to the door's history. Does anyone else know where the clock tower came from? Anju's smile faltered. It's always been there in my life. I'm sure my grandmother would have a story for you, though, if you wanted one. Maybe, Link said. It's hard for me to understand this place. It doesn't feel real sometimes, like it's all just a dream filled with ghosts. <laughs> no one here is a ghost, Anju said uncertainly, and it was only then that Link realized what he'd said. It's impossible to come back from being dead. She waited for Link to reply, but he didn't. She left the room without adding anything else. Once he was alone... Link turned over to face the wall. He stared ahead blankly, wiping away the tears that came to his eyes. 